Wil jij ook werken aan echt succesvolle apps en nog heel veel andere ontwikkelingen die vandaag en morgen het verschil maken? Do you want to challenge and be challenged? We zoeken altijd nieuwe developers. So, um, will you join us? Check onze site. Welcome. Uh, in these uh, weird uh, times with uh, all the uh, cancelled uh, in-person in, uh, uh, events, we present you three days of tech online, um, possible, made possible by uh, ABN AMRO and uh, co-sponsored by uh, Microsoft. And uh, in the next session, you will uh, hear Michael Bentley as a cloud evangelist of ABN AMRO. And uh, the second se session will be of uh, Scott Hunter, the program manager of uh, uh, director of Mark's. I heard myself twice. <laughs> um, uh, the, 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 the director of uh, program management at Microsoft, and he will uh, do a session about uh, uh, cloud native and uh, Azure, of course. And um, to join the conversation online, you have to click on the uh, uh, yellow button. Uh, on, on the, the streaming page, as you are all on uh, futuretech.nl slash uh, livestream. Click on the, the yellow button, and then uh, oh, the, it opens a Discord window where you can uh, enter the chat. Uh, in that chat, you can ask uh, questions, and in the next question, of the next, next session, the best question will be rewarded with a uh, Bluetooth speaker from uh, our head sponsor uh, Abin Amro, and there is even a goodie bag. So if you want to uh, have the goodie bag, also join the conversation in, uh, in Discord and um, uh, to get it. Um, so, well, I think it's now time to start the event. And um, so grab some uh, popcorn, some, grab something to drink, and uh, relax and enjoy and have uh, fun. So the next session will be, of the first session will be Michael Bentley, Cloud Evangelist at ABN Amaro. Yeah? Uh, so grab some uh, popcorn, some, grab something to drink, and uh, relax and enjoy, and have uh, fun. Okay. So the next session will be, of the first session will be Michael Bentley, Cloud Evangelist at ABN Amaro. Okay, thank you. So, hi everybody. Um, I'm Michael Bentley, and I've uh, been working at AB Namro now for the last 13 years. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is about uh, Azure DevOps being at the heart of our developer engineering ecosystem. So my responsibility is as a designer for the developer engineering ecosystem. So let's take you through. So Azure DevOps is at the heart of the new developer engineering ecosystem. And I'm going to tell you why uh, Azure DevOps was actually chosen explain to you the journey behind the decision that led to Azure DevOps, also um, explain to you the challenges that we faced and some of the solutions that we chose. So first of all, let's just have a look at ABN AMRO, uh, high level. So ABN AMRO aspires to be a leader in the European banking sector. And uh, we're currently going through uh, an IT uh, reorganization, and the focus is on implementing DevOps throughout the organization. And this is a part of our um, uh, desire to uh, provide in innovative and robust IT platforms so that we can deliver business solutions faster to the business. So let's have a look at the journey that we've uh, embarked on. Now, our journey to public cloud started back in 2016. And in 2016, 
ABN AMRO took it upon itself to explore um, the benefits and the possibilities of using public cloud. So Azure and AWS were um, chosen and two uh, teams were set up, product teams were set up to, um, uh, to basically roll out Azure and AWS within a, a finite uh, set of parameters to um, IT. In 2017, about nine to 12, about six to nine months into our journey, there was quite a, a, a com competitive uh, uh, sphere between the internal providers. Those are the teams for Azure and the teams for AWS. And it could really be um, interpreted as an unhealthy uh, com competitive uh, atmosphere. At that time, AWS was better promoted within ABN AMRO because the product owner for AWS was a more dynamic and extrovert uh, person. And Azure had a bad uh, reputation from day one within uh, the development community, which is predominantly a Java and mainframe, so COBOL development community. And Microsoft uh, developments, a .NET, a C++, a Dynamics, which is is a small part of what ABN AMRO does. And um, the non-Microsoft people saw Microsoft as um, uh, uh, a, a sort of a tainted party. And so it didn't have a good reputation from day one. However, what we started to see in 2018 was that this unhealthy competition was starting to fragment not only IT, but also the business as it was starting to sort of poll around the either AWS or Azure. So this really wasn't a sustainable IT uh, strategy. Um, and it was becoming too complex and actually too contentious to be of any benefit. So there was no way that we were going to realize our aspiration if we continued down this route. In 2018, um, we said that uh, this wasn't sustainable. So 2019, uh, after a deliberation period, uh, a new cloud strategy was, uh, was chosen. And um, surprisingly uh, to, to many people, um, um, senior management chose Azure as the target platform for ABN AMRO and not AWS. Not to spend too much time on it, but the reason basically for that was that the, the business proposition from Microsoft was much better than that from, uh, from Amazon. Plus, um, Microsoft and uh, sorry, Azure actually is a much better fit for an enterprise, um, at least that's how I, uh, Abin Amro uh, see it, than AWS was. So, uh, moving forward from 2019. And um, we see that uh, uh, our public cloud journey trans transformed and morphed into basically Azure. So Azure is our platform for, um, um, uh, for, for, for the future. So in 2020, we did an IT reorganization. And um, in the reorganization, um, we've stated that we will be migrating all workloads uh, to Azure, uh, except those for mainframe. And we'll be transitioning to a um, basically uh, an Azure policy and RBAC uh, governance and security model. So we've changed the way that we've actually been using Azure and um, uh, how we want to use it in the future. And now basically we have IT focused on one cloud which is going to enable us to um, achieve more autonomy and to uh, innovate and to do our transformation in a better way than we previously were doing. So um, the future for us for the next two or three years is actually focused on uh, moving away from uh, infrastructure as a service and focusing on Azure and favoring software as a service and platform as a service. 
So now let's zoom in into um, how this all affects and, and affects our decision to choose Azure DevOps. So what we need to do is, is move into looking at our developer enabling services, which is really the area that is uh, responsible for the support of the development community. And what we wanted to do here was to empower developers um, basically to be more autonomous, to have more, in, uh, so therefore more independence, and to encourage them to um, adopt and sort of inner sourcing model. Um, what we also needed to do was address a deficiency that we had in our developer enabling uh, systems and tooling. So we wanted to unify how we manage applications and software components. And then finally, we wanted to um, accelerate the flow of value. So basically how we deliver business solutions, the value to the business, we wanted to accelerate that. And we also wanted to provide developers with a better feedback mechanism based on uh, their deliveries. So the quality of their code. Now, some of the challenges that we were facing um, at that time um, is that uh, we have at Avian Amro a very diverse tooling landscape, which is uh, inherited through um, uh, uh, the acquisitions that Avian Amro has gone through. So it was heavily influenced by uh, what we had prior to um, uh, Fortis and, and uh, World Bank of Scotland's influence on Avian Amro. Um, we didn't really have a um, data model which adequately uh, reflected how we wanted to uh, manage applications and software components. So we had inconsistency um, throughout the tooling landscape. So depending on the tooling, um, it depended on what uh, data, metadata was recorded for our applications and software. And then um, the ability to have collaboration between development teams um, was hampered, hampered for a number of reasons, uh, one of which was policy, um, where we actually had policy that stated that um, uh, source code, for example, and the development um, of pertaining to source code um, was on a needs to know basis. So teams not involved in the development of a particular product were um, uh, not allowed uh, access to source code or any of the artifacts related to those products. So this, this was really seen by developers as hampering um, uh, their innovation. So let's now zoom into each of these challenges and see how we address them. So first of all, diverse tooling landscape. So first of all, our hosting platforms um, uh, back in 2018 and 19 and previously was basically a mainframe, predominantly mainframe, where we had our transaction, financial transaction uh, systems uh, running. Um, we had an on-premises cloud uh, managed uh, by a provider for us. And then we had our um, uh, involvement with Azure and AWS, and then we had other various uh, platforms which um, were all quite different, uh, unique in their own ways and requiring uh, different levels, different types of skills in order to uh, work with those platforms. And then specifically to um, how we were supporting, so developer enabling services and how we were supporting the delivery of um, uh, software and specifically on code quality, we have a number of tools uh, used and integrated into uh, pipelines. Um, on top of that, we had uh, um, different types of tooling um, to support our portfolio and backlog management. Obviously, uh, like many organizations, we have different programming languages in use. Um, but we also had uh, different uh, solutions for source code management, those supporting mainframe and some legacy systems and those systems that we were using in the cloud. 
Um, and then when it came down to a collaborative uh, collaboration, there were many different opportunities or um, platforms that supported collaboration, which didn't actually make it easy for the choice, which platform should I use in order to collaborate or share information with uh, others. And when it came to a dependency management and build orchestration, again, because of our diversified platforms, uh, we had uh, different solutions uh, supporting mainframe, supporting AWS, supporting Azure, um, and um, all uh, other platforms uh, in between. Um, release orchestration was no different. Uh, when it came to deployment, um, that left a lot to be desired as we had uh, different solutions in various states of uh, um, um, implementation, supporting some or all of our workloads. And it was uh, uh, not uh, clear for teams um, in some areas how they should actually deploy uh, their applications. And specifically, actually, in the Microsoft area, and um, that was poorly supported by the existing developer enabling services. So um, Jenkins was actually uh, used and we had various implementations of Jenkins for doing our orchestration, but it was um, not seen as uh, a future state uh, solution. So looking at, at the situation today uh, as our starting point for moving forward, what we started to do is to rationalize uh, the landscape. It's an ongoing process. We're focusing now on three platforms, basically two platforms, mainframe and Azure, but also leveraging SaaS where it makes sense. Um, what we've identified is that in all of the um, uh, capabilities that we have within developer enabling services, Azure and specifically Azure DevOps has an, an offering. And so therefore, um, because of the focus on Azure, um, we've decided that Azure DevOps offers um, to a large extent, the same capabilities as a lot of the other tools. And therefore we're focusing on using Azure DevOps first and foremost for uh, DevOps teams working on Azure, but also for mainframe moving forward. So mainframe uh, will do CI, CD using Azure DevOps. And um, even for on-premises, while we're in the uh, migration phase of moving away from uh, on-premises cloud and on-premises platforms to Azure, um, where we can leverage it, we will be using Azure DevOps. So as Azure DevOps is a SaaS that fits in well with our strategy to leverage SaaS where possible, um, we've chosen it for um, for that reason, uh, for one of the, that's at least for one of the reasons. And in addition, um, what we want to do is that where we're using our CI CD support tooling, um, we want to look at whether, whether, whether or not those are still viable solutions and where possible leverage software as a service or more platform as a service um, capabilities or variants. So the landscape is still in the throes of um, evolving, but a clear decision was made that it would be centered and focused on the use of Azure DevOps. Okay, so why Azure DevOps? Well, first of all, it's software as a service. Um, it means then that we don't need to manage infrastructure in the same way as we did for Jenkins. Um, and for managing uh, uh, Jira, for example, and a lot of the other tools um, for managing um, Excel deploy and Excel release. So we win uh, on one hand by leveraging software as a service, and we also win because we leverage the innovation that Microsoft provide. We couldn't um, um, begin to um, uh, achieve the same level of, of the same cadence of uh, uh, releases for Jenkins and uh, the other tools um, that Microsoft can offer with software as a service. The other thing is that Azure DevOps is enterprise ready. 
uh, meaning that it's uh, compliant. It meets a lot of the requirements or all of the requirements uh, for the European Union, for the Dutch uh, bank and for the European Central Bank. So it meets all the financial uh, regulations. Um, it's also um, compliant with our security uh, uh, needs. And therefore, it takes away a lot of the, uh, the concerns um, that, uh, that one may have in choosing a software as a service. And it has, of course, excellent out-of-the-box integration um, for um, meeting our IT strategy, which is Azure. So deploying to Azure and um, also for support for mainframes, so integration um, with various um, um, solutions that we use for mainframe. So it became um, an easy choice to make um, on paper. Uh, the initial uh, difficulty was selling it to non-Microsoft uh, uh, developers, which was the majority of the, of the community. However, uh, since uh, most teams or a lot of teams are now migrating to Azure, they actually find it as a very easy to use tool. So that was also an additional benefit, which we're very happy um, uh, uh, people, uh, developers found. So now let's have a look at our second challenge, which was the application and software component inconsistency. This is really because of our plethora of tools that we had, we didn't really have a consistent data model. We were using ServiceNow um, for sort of asset management for our, um, uh, um, for also for managing uh, um, uh, our business uh, products, but it really wasn't uh, suitable for um, a sort of an engineering perspective, how we should manage software um, uh, applications and uh, uh, components. We also had um, a number of um, applications, separate applications that didn't integrate well, um, which represented the different onboarding uh, entry points for developers. So if uh, developers wanted to onboard a new application for CI, CD, um, and uh, ensure that uh, um, standard pipelines could be used, then they needed to onboard separately for a sonar cube, uh, for, for Fortify and for some of the other tools. Um, and the metadata used in those tools was quite different. So we had different uh, views of um, uh, how applications are applications. And the process for onboarding was a sort of semi-automated process using Jenkins jobs and behind the scenes, it required a team of uh, dedicated uh, uh, engineers and support people to actually implement the onboarding process. And then finally, there was no coherent engineering data model, which really reflected how we uh, desired our, our sort of desire to deliver uh, software and manage software. So these were the challenges that we faced. Now, um, what we chose was a unified application and software components onboarding process. And this is really just part of um, um, the whole change, but I'm, I'm sort of calling out this one because it addresses one of the pain points, which was this onboarding process. Um, so why unified? Well, it improves the ease of use and the data consistency. So from our IT architects perspective, it was very important that we had a unified view of um, the applications we have and how those applications are used. And we wanted to provide component traceability, which we didn't have. So where is a component used within the runtime and what version is used and how does that trace back to actual source code and where is that source code? And we wanted to reflect that not in um, uh, tooling, but actually within a data model. And then um, we wanted to replace the multiple onboarding portals with basically a unified one uh, one-stop shop. So what did we do? So we've started to introduce a single point of entry for developers. That's um, a self-service um, request for fulfillment within ServiceNow. 
We've um, augmented ServiceNow and uh, introduced a uh, engineering configuration data model, um, which now reflects our centralized software component administration. And the solution that we're, we chose is a solution which um, ultimately will eradicate all the manual procedures that we have. So what is this solution? Uh, it's, a, it's a combination of, uh, it's a, it's a combination of the existing process um, and new processes. Ultimately, it will replace the existing process, but by doing it in the way that we're doing it at the moment, it maximizes our investment and it allows us to deliver value sooner. So it allows development teams to onboard quicker onto Azure and also integrate with the standard pipelines and the tooling that we offer developers. Um, and um, we're replacing legacy steps with microservices, which we see as future state. Now, let's just have a, a brief look at part of the um, application and software component management. So what we have is we have the concept of software applications. So these are applications which are um, registered uh, within the data model. Um, they exist uh, in the sense that um, there has to, they, they, they have a runtime. Now, these applications are made up of different components. Um, for example, uh, um, uh, we have an application which contains a web component and a database. Um, and what we want to be able to do is actually break down those components into their constituent parts. And um, what we have here is sort of a, a, a view of um, a software application itself is not just uh, the software that is developed by a team, but it's also all of the constituent components that make up the runtime environment. So. We have a .NET component. We have uh, Azure services, uh, for example, application insights, and we have some compute in the in the guise of Azure um, uh, App Service. Um, for the database, we have a schema. So this is developed, uh, managed by uh, the um, development team as code. And there's a SQL database, uh, and there's an Azure Key Vault. Now. This is just a, a representation of a fictitious application. But um, it's important uh, to understand that what we reflect in the uh, data model is the entirety. The runtime environment is reflected in, um, in the engineering configuration data model. And um, what we use is we don't use it necessarily for dependency management. All dependencies need to be defined in code. Um, so everything that is reflected within the uh, um, uh, within the data model is defined as code. Um, if we look then at the um, sort of the view of digital products. What do we mean by digital products? Well, actually applications and components, it's all about parts. So the, the data model talks about parts and parts um, uh, consist of one or more components. Now, a digital product is basically an application or a part that is, is shared with um, uh, other teams. So we also have the concept that each um, software application is owned by a uh, DevOps team and uh, one or more DevOps teams can also collaborate and contribute to the development of a software application. Now, um, if you have an application that is only known by um, the team that's developing it and it's not used, uh, it's not instantiated, then there's no digital product. So everything that is instantiated, i.e. has a runtime environment, is actually recorded within uh, the engineering configuration data model. Now, why the emphasis on the model? Well, it's important because for one, Azure DevOps, the way that we've set up Azure DevOps reflects 
the data model. So we have um, uh, projects that reflect the products that we have defined within the engineering configuration data model. Okay, let's have a look at um, the third challenge that we have, which is the inter-team collaboration. So some of the obstacles that, um, that uh, faced and still faces to some extent. Um, incompatible skill sets. Now, this is a strange one, but it, it was a fact of life. The fact that we had a um, uh, several different um, hosting platforms um, requiring different types of skills. We had uh, um, a mainframe, we had the on-premises cloud, um, et cetera. Um, required, uh, first of all, uh, um, uh, from a development perspective, uh, different languages were being used um, because uh, the business, uh, the way that uh, the business was organized, we had teams within uh, business units specific to uh, certain platforms. Um, it was difficult to um, to actually have focus um, and uh, um, allow uh, uh, different teams to actually um, cooperate. We also had a mindset and behavior issue in that uh, teams saw, were very protective of the products that they developed and also a bit scared of the products that they developed because as we started to expose the quality of products, um, teams were scared to share their code with other teams um, because maybe somebody would uh, be critical, overcritical of um, the software uh, quality. And then we had um, uh, policies from CISO, um, which discouraged and actually prevented, um, in some instances, cross-team collaboration because of this um, uh, policy of need to know um, only if you needed to know, could you be actually involved with the development of a product. So this really wasn't very much the sort of the growth mindset and the empowerment uh, model that we wanted within uh, IT. So this needed to change. So what's changing? So we focused on the use of Azure DevOps. So we've said now, okay, let's make it simple. Everybody uses uh, Azure DevOps, regardless of whether you're uh, on premises uh, at the moment, whether you're using Azure, um, whether you're using mainframe, what we want you to do is to start to use Azure DevOps um, at the earliest opportunity. So as teams migrate to Azure, they start to use it and uh, within other uh, facets of the business, teams are able to move over to Azure DevOps to leverage the use of say source code management or um, uh, the use of um, build orchestration. And what we've done there is we've provided read access across projects to all developers so that they can look at source code and they can look at uh, pipelines and they can see how teams are innovating so that they can learn from that. And we're also encouraging them to, um, um, uh, uh, to work sort of on an inner sourcing model. So we're encouraging them to collaborate with teams if they feel that they can actually add value. Now, obviously within a bank and a financial institution, we do have source code, which must be, um, uh, which is deemed uh, confidential and must be restricted. So that is respected within the engineering configuration data model. We also have the concept within the model and therefore within Azure DevOps of owning and contributing collaborating teams. Now, that's slightly different to um, read access. So within the model, you, can ha you have a team that owns a software product, but you also have teams that are um, actively contributing. So therefore they have the same rights as the owning team. So they basically have read rights to the branches and that they don't need to submit changes via pull requests, which other um, non-contributing teams would do via their read access. 
And then we're updating policies and controls. So we're um, bringing our risk control framework into the 21st century and we're updating the policies and controls in line with our aspirations and also in line with what developers want so that we can actually enable them to, um, to, to, to collaborate easier. Now let's just take an example of, of sort of this collaboration effort and um, a look at how we're using Azure DevOps um, in, in a way to provide um, a sort of pattern, what, was, what we call a pattern plaza. So within Azure DevOps, um, we have um, a number of um, uh, DevOps teams, product teams developing um, reusable patterns. And these reusable patterns uh, are specific, um, they could be, actually be anything, but these are specific to our internet banking platform. And these patterns rely on um, Azure uh, products that are developed um, as self-service products, also by a different product team within AB Namro, basically a, um, what, are, what we call our, our um, financial services cloud platform team. They've taken the Azure products that we all know, the Azure services that we all know and love, um, and made those available as self-service products um, so that they're compliant uh, within the bank. They provide those products via um, uh, basically installed extensions. So they publish their products to the internal marketplace for Azure DevOps. And um, teams, uh, for example, the Pattern Plaza team, um, basically take those uh, uh, products, self-service products, and create uh, patterns around them so that teams can consume these. So basically, th these, these patterns are described in YAML files and in, um, in code. And put into uh, repos. And these repos are made available as uh, uh, shared repos to consuming teams. And what happens there is that via a portal, which we call the Patent Powers Portal, which is actually running on Azure, uses uh, Azure services such as AppService, um, allows teams to request the patterns via the portal. And what happens is the, the artifacts within the Patent Powers uh, uh, repos are copied into the um, uh, projects, Azure DevOps projects um, um, of the requesting teams. Um, and from there, that instantiates basically provides them with the boilerplate codes um, with the pipelines that they require in order to um, do the build and to do uh, the deployment. And in addition, um, the service connections that you need in order to deploy to Azure, those are also provided through code. So this is, for me, a very good example of how ABNAMRO um, is encouraging innovation and encouraging teams to provide um, um, reusable and in an innovative solutions for and not just themselves, but for other teams. Um, and this helps uh, teams also understand better how the Azure platform works. So this is a, um, a very good example of our um, developer enabling services in action. Now, moving on to the flow of value and flow of feedback. Uh, this is another example for Azure DevOps. So Azure DevOps is uh, basically our, our tool of choice. So what we, um, uh, we have here is, and I mentioned it before, we want to leverage SaaS as much as possible. So obviously underpinning Azure DevOps, we need compute. And that compute represents our um, build and orchestration, uh, so build orchestration, release orchestration layers. Just what infrastructure are we using to support that? Um, we started off um, using self-hosted agents, so infrastructure. Uh, and I basically see that as an infrastructure service. And what we're trying to do now is to migrate more to sort of a pass and a SaaS solution underpinning uh, Azure DevOps. So 
looking now at elastic self-hosted um, agents and ultimately Microsoft hosted agents by uh, addressing some of the um, uh, uh, controls that uh, are in place today uh, to do with IP whitelisting um, um, so that we can actually uh, leverage um, using Microsoft hosted agents for doing deployments um, to Azure um, also to um, where possible to, uh, to VNets. Um, obviously, the flow of value starts with uh, defining uh, uh, the work items within boards and, um, and then developing uh, solutions um, and uh, managing those uh, solutions in the repos. So that includes the infrastructure as code, policy as code, application code, etc. So we want to strive to have everything described as code and that meets one of the aspirations of the engineering configuration data model. Um, so the flow of value basically streams from um, the uh, backlog management through to the delivery of um, solutions to the business. And that goes through various stages um, of uh, pipelines. So we go through uh, the pull request mechanism, which we uh, encourage teams to use, but we don't mandate as some teams are more mature than others. So some teams work with uh, um, pure CI and want to do trunk-based development. Other teams aren't yet at that stage. So they choose to uh, adopt a pull request mechanism, which is fine. Um, but what we want, whatever mechanism you use, we want to ensure that um, the feedback of those deliveries happens as soon as possible. And we find that Azure DevOps is an excellent tool for, for that. So at any stage within build orchestration and release orchestration, um, quality gates that fail or builds that fail provide feedback back to uh, the backlog so that teams can address those um, in, a, in a timely fashion. Um, and we're able to uh, introduce um, also, the, the move that we have towards uh, Azure policy and role-based access control, that's, we, we support that as well within Azure DevOps. Um, so the security policies that we have in place and the approval processes that we're introducing um, go hand in hand with, um, uh, with our strategy to uh, adopt a policy-based approach to, um, to security and to the management of our uh, software deliveries. So really coming Michael. now to the end Michael. of um, the journey. So our learnings, Michael, um, very important, I think, for, certainly for us and for anybody is that uh, vision and commitment and resolve are essential. So basically having a vision and a commitment to, um, um, uh, to achieve something. And in this case, our resolve to choose one cloud and to stick with it has helped and you need to have focus and plenty of time because our journey started in 2016 and it's going to go on for another three or four years and beyond um a little bit over the time started a bit later but that's basically what i wanted to share with you um i'm not sure if you have any time for questions i hope so um, yeah. but thank you anyway for having the time uh, spending your time with me Michael. Yes. Yes. We uh, th there are, are a lot of uh, questions in the in the on uh, Discord. Um, we cannot uh, uh, have them all, I think, uh, because there are that many. Um, yeah. I picked two of them, and uh, for uh, online, if you can answer them uh, uh, quite quick, then that would be great. And the rest of the sessions will of uh, the questions will be uh, handled offline, I think. Okay. Okay. Um, if you can do that in uh, in Discord, there are in your channel. Uh, in the general channel, there was a question of Ewout de Boer. He was asking from, uh, are you also moving the uh, mainframe jobs to Azure or are you rebuilding them? And uh, no, so what we're, so mainframe is a strategic platform. Um, what we are doing is mainframe modernization. 
Okay. Um, so um, on the mainframe, um, uh, loads are being uh, modernized and uh, the introduction of uh, uh, APIs. Um, uh, mainframe teams, the, the mainframe modernization team is busy introducing uh, APIs so that we can integrate from Azure directly to, uh, to mainframe. Um, and then what we will be doing is we'll be doing CI and CD for mainframe loads via Azure DevOps. So we'll verify the quality of the COBOL code using Azure DevOps, and then we'll integrate um, uh, deployment capabilities of Azure DevOps with ISPW so that we can deliver uh, workloads um, yeah, via ISPW, which is the only way to do it, but basically integrate um uh, devops with that okay and there was another question a rather interesting question uh, how do you deal with uh, external open source libraries because uh, they are yeah. uh, are they wrapped or are they treated as a part and how does that fit within your framework and okay. uh, and then a accompanying question was um how do you check the licenses and how do you handle that yeah so we use um we use a product called uh, nexus lifecycle uh, Nexus lifecycle is a mandatory component in all standard pipelines, whether it's Java, .NET, um, et cetera, even for COBOL. Um, that has, um, um, supporting that is a database behind it for open source components. So scans are done for all open source components and any um, vulnerabilities or license issues are highlighted. Okay. And there's also an overlap to some extent with the use of uh, Microfocus uh, Fortify um, uh, static code analysis, which does the same. It also looks at libraries, uh, open source libraries or any libraries. So um, we allow the use of uh, open source libraries if there are no vulnerabilities. So we encourage developers not to wait for uh, standard pipelines, but in the tooling that they're using, so Visual Studio, is integrated with Nexus Lifecycle or with SonarCube or with Fortify. So we encourage at that point to scan so that when they actually commit their code, there should be no issues with the pipelines, but the pipelines are also the fallback. Okay, cool. Well, there are a lot of more, more questions in, uh, in your uh, uh, talk to the speakers uh, channel. Uh, okay. So I hope you uh, have, are, will be able to handle them offline. Um, I hope so. And we have a uh, little break for now. And then the okay. next uh, speaker, then we, we can set up uh, the things for uh, Scott Hunter. So uh, thank you for uh, uh, doing the session. And I hope you uh, will find a good question for uh, in, in the, 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 the list of questions because you still have to give a uh, Bluetooth okay. speaker away. <laughs> All right. Uh, and uh, well, okay. Thank you. Thank so you very now much. We have a we have a break for five minutes or so, and okay. then uh, we'll be back here again. All right, thank you.